Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder and leader of the healthcare practice at Retzel and Andrus. Today, I'm joined by Joe Lassard, who's a principal with PBM and has been there since 2009. Joe is a CPA, and we work together on many of physician, dental, and other type of professional practices, and he's a real expert in this area. I'm very excited to have him here. And what we're going to be talking about is when you're looking at a practice or starting a practice or buying a practice, how do you decide which one is right for you? And what are some of the considerations that you need to make um, when choosing which direction to go? So um, I guess I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. And I really look forward to hearing your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, thanks for having me, Erica. Uh, well, I, I work with a lot of physicians and dentists uh, that are taking the leap into practice ownership. Uh, some are you know, looking to buy an existing practice and some are starting their practice from scratch. And it's an exciting, but you know, obviously a nerve wracking process. Uh, I work with uh, professional business management. We are a healthcare consulting firm, We've been around since 1932. So a very long time. We focus on the Chicagoland market. So we, we kind of know what's going on in the area. Um, again, a lot to decide on, but kind of before I kind of get into the pros and cons of starting or buying, uh, the very first thing I want to do, the kind of the, the one takeaway for everybody, uh, kind of the very first thing you should do is uh, the very first, first important thing you should do is assembling your team. Uh, I cannot stress this enough. This includes your accountant, your attorney, your banker, practice broker, et cetera. You don't have to know it all going into this journey. Uh, this is what these people are here for. Um, so definitely get them involved. Assemble your team before making this leap. Now, the question, uh, the topic of today is deciding whether you should purchase an, an existing practice or you start your own. Purchasing a practice is certainly appealing because a lot of the big decisions have already been made for you. You know, the location, the office layout, the furnishings, the staffing, all that's there for you. But the biggest reason doctors elect to purchase a practice is because of the existing patients and the potential goodwill that's already in place. This allows you to have an income stream on day one. And that's usually, you know, when you go into this venture, you know, the financial side of it is, is huge. Uh, either A, you're spending a lot of money to buy a practice or start up a practice. And to have an income stream on day one is, is, is great. Um, you know, but the problem with purchasing a practice, you, you're purchasing everything, right? So you, a lot of what is deemed as positives, you know, the, again, location, the office layout, staffing can also be negatives. The location might not be your dream location. Uh, the office furnishings and equipment could be old and you might need a refresh, which further adds to your costs. You know, oftentimes there is, isn't much to be done with the layout either. Um, you know, the staff might be resistant to change and stuck in how the old owner did things, or sometimes um, reviewing a practice right now that the staffing wages are, are really high. You know, they're paying a hygienist $65 an hour, which is crazy, or a front office desk is paying $30 an hour. Right. You're, you're stuck. You, you absorb all of that. Right. Um, no, so I agree. So you trade off, you, you take you kind of take what you get, which is why yeah. uh, that diligence piece is so important, right? Uh, to kind of understand who works there, how much they're getting paid, uh, you know, even the lease arrangements, whether there's money to remodel maybe or something like that, right? So you're, you're getting that income stream, but, you know, you also kind of take everything else as it is in some cases. Yeah. And, you know, the last thing you want to do is go into a practice that you're purchasing and changing things from day one, right? You, you can't do that because if you start changing things to make it your way right from the get-go, you're going to, you're going to ruffle some feathers, either ruffle some, some of that office dynamic with the staffing. Um, or if you change the hours that you were, that, you know, like you didn't like the, the, the sellers uh, hours. Now you're changing up to different hours. 
Um, well, now you might be losing some patients that were used to those evening appointments or early morning appointments that you no longer have, uh, or you had a Saturday now that now you don't, right? So you, you're change if you change things um, too quickly, you often um, you're, you you you're not getting what you paid for. Right. Uh, yeah. And let me add to that, that, you know, although your team will try and ask all the right questions when you're going into a practice and try to document it in a way that's most protective, um, there are so many times when things are discovered, um, you know, after the deal has already closed. And, um, you know, some of the issues that I see are extremely outdated, um, EMR or, you know, record uh, equipment. And that can be really expensive. And if it's, you know, you're only getting what you paid for, and then you have to go spend a lot of money to replace that. That's something that can be a real deterrent to buying a particular practice. Um, also, you know, you're buying that income stream, but if you didn't do what you needed to do to protect it, um, meaning that the owner and other people working there can't steal all those patients once you close, then you also lose money. And it's surprising how many uh, physicians and dentists really don't have documents in place that protect those things. So you're paying a lot for it, but then you have no way to protect it after you close um, and you can't possibly, you can get the owner to sign something potentially, but you can't get everybody else who works there. And uh, that to me is kind of what, when you buy a practice uh, can really uh, decrease the value quite quickly after closing. Yeah. You know, I try to break it down as simple as possible and try to equate things or uh, provide some analogies. And everyone or most people have kind of gone through some sort of real estate transaction personally. And when you, when you do that, right, you have a realtor and they help you find the place and you go through it, and it looks great, or or you see you're able to see certain things. Uh, but again, you're able. To, there's once you buy it, then you start uncovering maybe oh, there's some things that did that did it wasn't caught in the inspection process, or things start to fall apart, or oh, you know that you kind of go into it saying oh, this appliance looks great, but then shortly after, then you need to replace them, replace them all. Uh, there's right. only so much you can do until you, uh, you know, before purchasing a practice, but oftentimes things come up afterwards. Exactly. So then, you know, do you still see people more often buying practices rather than starting their own? I know I do. I, I see a good mix. Um, I, I tend to see more people purchasing if I was to give a better ratio on it, probably, probably six, probably 65, 35 mm -hmm. uh, people that are, that purchase a practice versus uh, starting up. Uh, and, and, and I, you know, main, the main reason is the income stream that they get from day one. And a lot of the admin or a lot of the big decisions have, like I said, have already been made. So when you're deciding, obviously, one of the key things that you're getting that income stream, that's true, but often you may need to borrow quite a lot of money to mm -hmm. achieve that. Um, I'm wondering, is it, you know, worthwhile? Does it cost less to start a practice from scratch versus borrowing a huge amount from the bank? Do you typically see that it is, you know, less expensive to do one or the other? Um, I'll, you, I'll be the typical accountant. Uh, it depends. <laughs> um, you know, the good, the good news about buying a practice, uh, you know, physicians and dentists uh, you know, working with a, a healthcare banker often are able to get financing pretty easily, right? They, they look at the, finan the finances of the practice you're purchasing and they're able to get a good amount of money uh, from the get-go without having to put a whole lot of their own money down because uh, they're, they're basing that off of the, uh, the, the financial health of the practice that they're purchasing. Um, so that's certainly helpful. Now, starting up your practice, you kind of have to have a pro forma done. You're trying to make a you know your a, a proper business plan to uh, justify what you're asking for from the bank. And the banks aren't as mm, they're not willing to just shell out a bunch of money just because of that. They're more willing to give money based on a uh, practice that's already in place. So that's a big reason why people tend to uh, also purchase a practice. 
So are there any pros to starting a practice then? Yeah, Um, absolutely. Uh, probably the biggest pro is it's it, you get to develop it your way. You get to choose what EMR system you want. You get to choose the location. You get to choose the practice name, the office layout, the equipment choices, the furnishing, your staffing. It's all you. You get that. You get the choice. Um, which is the main reason people do that. But there's a lot of cons or a little ch more challenging uh, aspects of that. You know, staffing is the biggest challenge all of my clients face. Uh, it's the number one or number two topic of every client meeting I have. Either you can't find good staff or uh, when you do, you have to pay them more and they don't want to work. <laughs> so the, 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 the inflation uh, cost of everything has hit staffing probably the most. Um, and the dynamics, to, you know, all these pre-COVID uh, or these COVID temporary costs are not temporary. It has increased the cost of everything and staffing and their work, uh, their work level has changed uh, because of that. A lot of people want to work from home. You know, hygienists for my dental clients have demanded a much higher, uh, you know, uh, pay than they ever have. Um, so again, staffing is the biggest challenge everyone has. And now you have to find them, right? So you have to go through that process. And it's, you know, the the way that I describe it, for every 100 applicants you have uh, on any whatever search engine you choose, um, you know, half of them are pure garbage. I mean, like I, I, you, don't, you don't even, you wonder why they're even applying. And then from that half, half are worthy of, uh, you know, potential phone interview, and then half of that are worthy of an in-person interview. So you're, you're out of that 100, you're down to about 12, 15% of people that you're actually bringing in to talk to. There's a lot of work going in, in involved in that. Um, you know, the, the downside of starting up your own practice, of course, is you don't have patience. So you need to market. You need to get a, mar a healthcare marketing professional. You need to get your SEO, get your website, and do some uh, true marketing, whether it's flyers or what have you, but you need to get someone involved to help you get your name out there. And hopefully, you know, you know, a lot of these uh, physicians and dentists who are starting up their own, usually they're starting up their own just outside of a non-compete area. So they don't have too many patients able to follow them too, too much into their existing, to this new space. Um, so they really have to start over. Right. Uh, and a lot of times they might have signed something that also prevents them from uh, soliciting any other oh, staff yeah. or referral sources. So, you know, you know, patients, though, if non-competes and solicitations are written properly, uh, should be able to follow. But it could be a distance factor uh, yeah. as well. So, um, yeah, that is I mean, that is one of the biggest challenges, I think, if you're um starting a practice. But on the other hand, if you work in a practice uh, or you previously owned a practice, I would imagine starting your own comes a little bit easier, right? Because yes. uh, you know what to think about, you know what to expect. Um, and of course, you have to take on uh, loans to get that started. And there's that uncertainty, you know, will we be able to turn this into something? Uh, how long will it take? Uh, you know, can we afford you know, our overhead, can we afford, you know, the loan repayment, et cetera. So um, the people that I work with who start their own practices, um, you know, they're very excited, but there's that reality to think about as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's a big challenge. Um, and again, is, you know, hopefully you've assembled your team to help guide you along the way, whether it's a consultant for, you know, setting up your financial policies or setting, you know, working with uh, someone like yourself on the, uh, you know, looking over whatever their non-competes are. So see, fi finding out where they can find a space <clears throat> um, and start the practice. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pieces involved. You know, again, it, it, when you start up a practice, um, the costs just seem to mount up and you, Despite right. that, despite you know your uh, design and build teams, you're likely going to have to go through an office build out. And despite their best efforts, uh, their estimates um, can get can change so dramatically depending on what 
they find behind the walls or in the foundation, nope, so there's something wrong there. They just didn't pass the inspection, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a lot that can be, it can just add to that. And it, 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 it can get very costly. Right. And and one thing I've noted is that if you don't surround yourself with the right team, you don't get advice from the start, things can actually end up being more expensive for you in the long run. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to pay for this person. I don't want to pay for that. But at the end, I, most cases you end up paying more than you would have if you got an advice from the start. And a big piece of that is really uh, planning ahead and having that business plan. A lot of people I work with don't really have a business plan. Uh, yeah. They don't know how to put it together. They just want to start a practice. And I think taking that extra step is important. It's really not your lawyer that kind of helps you develop that business plan. It's more your financial um, advisors or consultants that really help you with that piece. Yeah. You know, I, again, a lot of these physicians or dentists, you know, usually they have worked somewhere before. They're not just coming out of school and starting up their right. practice, buying a practice. So that's good. I, re I absolutely recommend that they need to, you know, uh, fine tune their skills and uh, understand uh, kind of what a what a real office looks like, what a real practice uh, how it runs. Um, now, there's only so much you can really learn without getting involved. Um, you're kind of seeing bits and pieces of it. So that certainly helps. Uh, you get exposure to whatever EMR billing software. Um, you kind of know what a, an employee handbook looks like. You kind of know how to potentially pay some bills. Um, you know, some of the vendors, the equipment vendors out there, professional supplies. Uh, so you kind of know some of that going into this. So you're not going in completely blind, but assembling your team to help you with really running the business and starting a business is the biggest thing for you because you went to school to be a physician, you went to school to be a dentist. Right. Now, Absolutely. Do that. That's what, that's what you went to school for. And that's why, that's <laughs> why you're, that's why you're good. Right. That's right. why patients are wanting to see you because you're a good physician. You're a good dentist. No offense. You're not taught how to run a business in school. Right. So right. you're absolutely your team right. to help you with that is important. Right. There are some very savvy dentists and doctors out there, but for the most yeah. part, they haven't really been exposed to business type issues. You know, one other thing I just want to mention is kind of the timeline. So uh, whether you're buying a practice and its assets or you're starting a new practice, um, which may have its own delays because of real estate or whatever, um, most dental and medical practices do take insurance, right? And so one of the things that people tend to forget about is uh, time to credential, right? Yep. And that's something that really needs to be built in. And uh, I think some, for some reason, even uh, people working with uh, consultants, whatever, tend to, to not talk about this and then to be surprised about the timing issue. So just yep. wanted to kind of throw that out there um, that you always need to take that into account in your timing. Yeah, some can take I mean, months, um, depending on, on your situation. Uh, where you where you know where you're coming from, so it could right. take quite a bit of time. Yeah, and people think if they're credentialed somewhere, they could just take it with them, but that's not the way it works. Oh, you have to get yeah. re-credentialed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. all right. So, any additional comments on the pros and cons of starting versus uh, buying a practice that you want to share? Yeah, no, I mean, either either way, it's a it's an exciting uh, and like I said, nerve wracking venture. Um, you know, take your time in deciding what's best for you. Um, and again, self awareness is 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 crucial and to understand what you are willing to un endure and what you are willing to to take on. Again, if you have a good amount of savings at home and you can afford to uh, do a startup, um, that. I absolutely encourage it because again, you get to do it your way. Uh, but if you don't have the the stomach for only seeing a couple patients, uh, you know, a day for a little while to, you know, then then certainly look into buying a practice. And then there's a lot of, you know, medical and dental brokers that can help you find that practice. Get again, getting them involved. And you know what? They don't cost you anything. And it's just like, again, it's, I, I go back to equating it to real estate. Getting a, or having a realtor find you a home doesn't cost you anything. It costs the seller something, but that's not if helping them find the right practice for you. Get getting them involved is important. Right. 
All right, great advice from Joe Lassard. And if any of you have questions, I'm going to include Joe's information so you can definitely reach out. Um, this has been the Health Law Hotspot, and you can see some of our other podcasts at ralaw.com. We welcome your feedback, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks for joining us. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.